Hi, I'm Rachel. Well, it's near the beginning of July, so I'm starting with uh, my short story videos that I do this month. For the past couple of years, I have been slowly inching through these four collections, but I also intend to read this entire book uh, this month. I mean, it's not very long, but it is also just the short story collection that I decided I wanted to read. <laughs> uh, I um, most recently mentioned it uh, in my mid-year freakout check-in tag. Uh, it's Athletic Shorts by Chris Crutcher. But before I get to reading and discussing the first story on this video, I'm going to quickly recap the most recent stories I've read in the other collections. And I'll have a link to my short story videos listed down below in case you want to hear other short stories from these collections or other collections and my thoughts on them. <laughs> I'm starting with the Vintage Book of Contemporary American Short Stories edited by Tobias Wolf. And the story I read this year in the collection is called Talk of Heroes by Carol Bly. And this is indeed a very talky story. Uh, a lot of it is made up of just one glompy, multi-page paragraph of uh, our narrator talking about the tale of a war hero. Uh, the narrator is named Emily, although, frankly, she, I don't know how much that really matters. She's part of a Norwegian uh, society club that is uh, giving recognition to a World War II hero called Willy Korig. And she introduces him thusly, starting with when she met him 11 years after the war, and he, would, uh, he was living in Oslo and playing tricks on German travelers, like uh, sidling up to them when he heard them speaking German and like uh, talking as though he were friendly, but actually like teasing out of them that they were stationed there during the war and then he would beat them up. And the reason he did that is because he was once a German war prisoner. He had a job in Norway of uh, transferring or helping to transfer goods to England and he was captured and tortured for information and he held off long enough that his companions who were on a run to England were able to get there. So that's his uh, war story. So I guess uh, we're supposed to be focusing on the way that war heroes are venerated. Uh, you know, we have this narrator who I don't know, it doesn't seem that important on her own, and she, you know, starts with a story about herself and how she knew him, like, afterwards, and then it goes into a very long and rambly tale about uh, his decision and his, like, heroism to, you know, resist the abuse as long as he could. Uh, although now, like, in the present, he's just an alcoholic, and it doesn't seem like the people in the society are that impressed. There's also like a framing device about Emily's daughter and like things that she's facing. But in general, uh, this story didn't move me that much. I just uh, didn't feel like uh, I got that invested in any of the characters through all of the clumpy dialogue. Although I suppose it's an interesting premise how we talk about our war heroes. Next, I've read from Great Short Stories by American Women, edited by Candace Ward. And particularly this year, I read A New England Nun by Mary E. Wilkins Freeman, who uh, was writing in the latter half of the 19th century and the early half of the 20th. And this story is uh, about a spinster of sorts, Louisa, who 15 years earlier was engaged to this man, Joe, who decided to make his fortune over in Australia. And it was supposed to, I suppose, be a quick venture, but instead it took 14 years. And in the interim, uh, Louisa never married. She lost her mother and brother and was sort of more alone than ever, but she never, you know, got hitched to anyone else. And I think in a way, you know, she was a little lonely, but it also seemed like she had a pretty solid, you know, life on her own. Uh, so when he comes back and decides, oh, well, I guess you waited for me and we should get married, uh, it's a little bit of an inconvenience. And like the first... Uh, few pages are like their awkward sort of get together like you know they're kind of courting or you know you know getting together in the evening to try to get to know each other before their wedding which would be in a week's time from the start of the story uh, and it mostly you know Louise is going through her life and how settled she is and just how weird it is for Joe to be back and so so it seems but I guess 
it's like what else could she do in a way I mean this is a time period I assume where really uh, women aren't alone as much and in fact in the pr preview to this story um, I guess it was Ward uh, who wrote the preface to say that uh, this author often wrote about women uh, who were unconventional for the time so uh, Louisa just kind of seems like she likes her, you know, uncloistered nun lifestyle. And on top of that, uh, she kind of learns that there's a thing going on between uh, Joe and uh, a woman who looks after Joe's mother, who incidentally also doesn't like Louisa that much. So, you know, <laughs> so she kind of uh, deftly uh, gets herself out of this and like, uh, tells Joe, you know, we don't have to go through with this, and it seems like, you know, all is good from there. So, an unconventional story for its times, I suppose. But I just uh, like the whole issue of, you know, a uh, woman alone finding contentment and being alone. I guess I find that relatable. <laughs> from this collection, My First Love Affair and Other Stories by Shola Malechem, I read Geese by Shola Malechem. Uh, where he is writing from the point of view of a woman. The same sort of eccentric voice of a Yiddish character, sort of the nebishy, neurotic Yiddish character that he usually writes, except this is very much from a woman, and I feel like he just, you know, he repeats it over and over again, because she's trying to tell us the story about how she raises geese to sell, but then she always gets sidetracked by gossiping about her husband and her kids and, you know, her town in general, and it gets, you know, you know, a little bit negative and gossipy in that way that then she stops herself and says, you know, I'm actually not a negative gossipy person after she says these things and then repeats a line about, you know, how what they say about women, you know, rambling on. <laughs> and it's over and over again to the point where I'm like, okay, we get it already. <laughs> And also, do I think it's fair that him points out that she's doing all of this because she's a woman when he has plenty of uh, male characters who have done the same in other stories? Eh. <laughs> but it definitely is an amusing story. It's, you know, a very unique sort of voice, a very stereotypically like Yiddishy humor voice about, you know, a uh, character from a specific sort of uh, Jewish town uh, gossiping about her life. <laughs> So, and about, you know, what's going on around her. So I enjoyed it for that. And finally, I have Oi Karumba, an anthology of Jewish stories from Latin America, edited by Elan Stavins. And this year I read Innocent Spirit by Alicia Steinberg. And this is about a young girl uh, who I assume is growing up in Argentina because Steinberg uh, ended up settling down in Argentina. I should also say this story was translated from the Spanish by Andrea G. Labinger. But anyway, this story is about a young girl, uh, presumably growing up in Argentina, going to school predominantly with Catholics, and I think in an attempt to fit in, she really tries to downplay her Judaism and sees it as a weird, eccentric religion, especially amongst a bunch of Catholics and I think secret agnostics and atheists, although they can't even talk about that at school because of, I guess, the overarching, overwhelming Catholic influence. And in the course of this very small story, she ends up going to like a Jewish family wedding, uh, which then when she tries to explain to her friends, oh, I went to a, a wedding over the weekend and they say, what church? She says, oh, they're agnostic. And I guess in a way it's about uh, assimilation uh, and the pool to want to be like the people around you. And doesn't seem like she's getting much out of uh, Judaism and her family life, at least in this small little story, which is a shame, but I guess that's what it is a lot of times. But okay, I've crossed off yet another year of slowly eking through those collections. I'll be back to talk in probably a lot more detail about the story in this collection because it is the story that inspired one of my favorite movies, Angus. So, ee, we'll see how it goes. Okay, and I'm back to do a clip I feel like is in 25 years in the making here, where I talk about the short story that inspired one of my favorite movies. The short story being A Brief Moment in the Life of Angus Bethune by Chris Crutcher. So, I'll speak generally about the ways that the stories are the same in a summary way. Angus Bethune is a high school football player. He is 
fat, but you know his athletic ability uh, is that he is a football player. And he is uh, crowned, it seems like as a joke, uh, to become like a winter ball king for a winter dance at school. And his longtime crush, Melissa Lefevre, is crowned to be the queen. And Melissa is dating uh, this, um, you know, asshole jock Rick Sanford. Uh, and uh, basically, the events of both of the stories revolve around Angus going to the dance and he's had some sort of pep talks by his family about, you know, being confident in your own skin and being who you are. And he goes to the dance and Rick is an ass to him, but Melissa, you know, takes his side and, you know, they actually dance and they get their moment, which is something that Angus talks about a lot in both stories. He just wants his moment where he can, you know, have a dance with a girl that he's crushed on for years. And uh, they have more than that. They dance, uh, then he walks her home, and it's just kind of a magical night in that way. Uh, but the, uh, the movie, of course, is uh, a lot broader than that. Uh, th there is one thing about uh, the short story that sticks out in a, quite the surprising way. Uh, I never would have guessed it, but uh, Crutcher apparently, uh, when he wrote the story for a friend's, you know, YA kids collection, uh, he decided he wanted to have, you know, Angus as a fat kid playing, you know, football, and that he'd have two sets of gay parents. And this story was written, I would assume, sometime in the 80s, because, uh, you know, it was then published uh, in the 89, I think this book was, and Angus the movie came out in 95. And I guess I have to start thinking about when exactly Will and Grace came on the air or whatever, but uh, in general, I don't think a lot of teen movies from the mid-90s uh, were that open with, you know, gay families. And in fact, in the movie, uh, Angus's uh, parents, instead of being like, in, in, well, I'll start with the book, like in, in the short story, his, you know, he had a mom and dad and they divorced and then they married same-sex partners. Uh, and in the movie, uh, his dad died when he was young and he's been raised by his uh, single mother, Kathy Bates, and her father. Uh, he's in the picture too. But uh, so in the story, the fact that uh, he is raised by these two sets of uh, same-sex parents who called themselves married, although I wouldn't think that would be as official back then, uh, it's, a, it's a, you know, it's, that's a big impetus, probably as big in the story as his weight issues about, you know, not fitting in with his classmates and, you know, Rick makes some homophobic statements and that sort of thing. And Angus even is, you know, a little bit homophobic, like whining to his parents, like, I don't want to, you know, hear about your gay lives. I only care about straight kissing or, I don't know, stuff like that, which just makes me think, you know, about kids today and, you know, how much more open we are to, uh, you know, queer sexual expression. <laughs> uh, but the uh, movie really focuses a lot more on his issues with weight. And also, Rick is a much bigger antagonist uh, in the movie. Uh, it, it, he's very secondary in the story, and Angus is mostly focused on uh, on Melissa, but I would say it's the opposite in a way. Like he's still a kind of obsessed with Melissa in the in the in the movie, but really it's his uh, never-ending feud with Rick. That Rick has you know been pushing his buttons and bullying him and you know saying horrible things about his weight like ever since they were tiny kids, and Angus has been responding with aggression, which is something they also hint at a bit in the story, that, you know, he's this big football player, so he can be aggressive. Uh, and they're, they're kind of stuck in that rut. And I'd say in the movie, uh, it's a lot more about getting him out of that rut. And the whole idea of accepting yourself and realizing that no one is normal and that there is no normal, which was a big takeaway message for me in the, in the movie. I mean, that's such a big moralizing part of the movie. And maybe it's a little too, like, neat-ended, but... I found it so moving as well, and he also has, you know, a friend that he can, you know, bounce things off of in the movie that isn't in the short story, and, uh, yeah, he has this great relationship with his grandfather, and, you know, that's not as much of a thing in the story here, where he's, you know, interacting with his parents and his step-parents, and in fact, there's a very, there, there's a lot of great witty lines from this that make it into the movie, and there's this great parallel uh, to, uh, you know, what it means to be brave and how Superman isn't brave because he's indestructible, which uh, in the movie is given to uh, the grandfather and in the book is given to his stepfather. 
but it, it, I don't. I think it lands more, and it packs more of a punch in the in the movie. But even if it's because you know everything is, you know, a little more you know moral of the story is perhaps, and there's also subplots and just things are more fleshed out, which I guess I was expecting. You know, I would think that you know when it comes to a short story versus a movie, there might actually be more space in a movie to flesh things out. It's kind of the opposite of a novel being turned into a movie where usually you have to take out a lot of subplots. So yeah, uh, I guess those are my rambly thoughts, if they make any sense. Uh, I've been nervous about this a little bit because I love the movie so much, uh, so I wasn't sure how I would take this. I do think that, you know, there's a lot more in the movie I really do think that uh, even if there's a little bit of a moralizing tint to it, I think it's a good moral for kids, first of all. <laughs> uh, for, it certainly helped me out at that age. And I just think there's just more meat on the bones of uh, the uh, movie. But uh, at the same time, I was g glad that a lot of uh, Angus's witticisms uh, made it in from his first person narration to the, you know, voiceovers that he had <laughs> in the movie. Uh, and I guess it's intriguing in its way that uh, Crutcher decided to write about gay issues at, you know, at this time in the 80s when, you know, the, the gay lifestyle was much more controversial, as it were. So, yeah, that's just very interesting. And I'll be curious to see uh, what else uh, comes out of this collection. I think, actually, the rest of the short stories in this collection are from characters from novels he wrote, and he's continuing their stories, but Angus Bethune is a standalone. He's not a part of any novel. But uh, I'll be checking back, I guess, in my Friday Reads about the rest of this collection, so stay tuned. But in the meantime, I hope to make it on this channel even a little earlier than Friday to do what should be my final Goodreads Choice Awards video for uh, 2021. <laughs> I feel like I've cramming in too much front list anyway into my reading and I want to back off and do more back list again. <laughs> I got lots of, uh, you know, other books I want to read as well, but I have just a couple I want to mention in a final Goodreads Choice Awards video, so stay tuned. In the meantime, I hope you're having a great start to the beginning of your month and whatever your reading or other uh, goals might be. Thanks so much for watching, everyone, and I'll see you next time.